Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about, and this is actually the last stuff that we're going to end up talking about this semester. So this is what we're going to spend this week on, is talking about the Neiman Pearson Lemma and most powerful critical regions. So uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of introduction so that we can try to get through some of this uh, notation and definitions on the video so that we can actually spend time in class solving problems. So, all right. The definition here is our C is going to be a critical region for some hypothesis test with a significance level of alpha. And to start with, we're going to assume that our hypothesis test is two simple hypotheses. So you only have two possibilities for the parameter. Either the parameter is theta naught or the parameter is theta one. So we're not doing compound hypotheses here. We're only doing simple hypotheses. It's either equal to one of them or it's equal to the other one. So we say that C is a best critical region of size alpha if we take some other critical region, the probability that C, given that theta is theta 1, is greater than or equal to the probability that you, have, that you land in D, uh, given that theta is equal to theta 1. Okay, so that's lots of words. So let's talk about what this is actually computing. All right, so remember that C, or the critical region, with a significance level of alpha means this is the probability of rejecting given that the null hypothesis is true, right? That's what the alpha represents. It's the probability of making a type 1 error, correct? That's what the alpha is. So it's the probability that you reject given the null hypothesis is true. So notice here, if I take a C or take a D, both of these have the same probability of happening if the null hypothesis is true. So we're comparing two critical regions where you get the same probability of a type 1 error. Okay, so what's going on over here? This says the probability that you land in your critical region, so the probability that you reject, given theta equals theta 1. So this is the probability that you reject, given the null, or excuse me, given, given the alternative hypothesis is true. Okay, we want that probability for C to be at least as big as the same probability for D. So again, this has something to do with power, right? This has something to do with rejecting when this is, this is rejecting, this is we should reject. So this is something to do with power, right? So the idea of this being a best critical region is that we want to be more likely to reject than any other critical region that we could possibly come up with. So what all of this means is that if the alternative hypothesis is true, then we want to reject, we want that probability of rejecting to be as big as possible, and that happens when we use the critical region C. So that's what we mean by a best critical region of size alpha. It's the one that gives us the best chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when we're supposed to. Okay, so our goal in these problems that we're gonna be doing are finding these best critical regions. So we're gonna use something where it's referred to as the Neiman Pearson Lemma. All right, so we're gonna start with a random sample. That will denote the PDF of the sample or the, the random the, the distribution like we always do. And we denote the likelihood function, like we always do. And uh, this really should be an x sub i here, because I'm going to do the product of all of the PDFs when we put in x sub i for the PDFs, just like we've always defined our likelihood function. So that should be an x sub i. All right, so we're looking for a positive constant k and a region c. Okay, those are the Honestly, we don't actually ever find the constant k. We just want to make sure that this constant k exists. All right. So if there exists a constant k, positive, and a region such that three conditions happen. So the first condition is that the probability that your x1 out to xn actually land in the region c, given theta equals theta naught is alpha. So this is the probability that you reject because you landed in the critical region. So this is probability that you reject when you shouldn't. No, or, yeah, no hypothesis is true. 
is equal to alpha. So this is condition one. All right, second condition, the likelihood of theta naught over the likelihood of theta one is less than or equal to K for anything in your critical region. So let's talk about this for what this means for a second. Remember, this is in your critical region, right? So X1 out to Xn is in the critical region, which means if this were to happen, you reject, right? So if, if I want the likelihood that I reject that if theta naught is true to be less than the likelihood that I reject if theta one is true. That's what this statement's saying, right? <clears throat> I, I don't want to reject if the null hypothesis is true. I do want to reject if the null hypothesis is not true. So the likelihood of theta naught better be less than the likelihood of theta one. That's what this is representing if I'm in the critical region, okay? So you can probably guess what the third condition is. The likelihood of theta naught over the likelihood of theta one is greater than K if we're not in the critical region, right? Think about why that we want that to be true again, right? If it's in the critical region, we don't want to reject if the null hypothesis is true. So we want that likelihood to be less than the likelihood for theta one because that would be the case that the alternative hypothesis is true. And then we want exactly the reverse to happen for condition three here. All right, so if you can find the C and the positive K so that you meet all three conditions, then you're guaranteed to get a best critical region of size alpha for the uh, simple hypothesis testing against theta zero and theta one. Now they do the proof in the book. We're not gonna go through the proof of it because I'm not gonna re re uh, expect you to reproduce the proof on anything. I mean, it's not a bad proof, it's just I'm not gonna expect you to redo it. All right, I'm more interested in solving the problems. They're complicated enough. Okay, so let's look at the first problem that's in your book. Take a random sample from a normal distribution, know the variance, don't know the mean. The first thing we wanna do is show that a critical region is, def that is uh, a best critical region is defined as the mean is less than or equal to some specific number. If we have mu is 80 against the mu is 76, and then we'll find what N and C are, so the sample size and the bound on the critical region, so that our alpha is 0.05 and our beta is 0.05. Okay, so the Neiman Pearson lemma says that I have to analyze the ratio of the likelihoods. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Okay. So likelihood of 80 divided by likelihood of 76. Our PDF for the normal, right? It's one over sigma, which is eight, square root of two pi, e to the, I just use the exp here. So this is e to a power. So this is e to the negative x minus mu, mu is uh, 80 in the null hypothesis, divided by two times the variance. That's where the 128 comes from. Same exact expression in the denominator, except that I got a 76 here instead of an 80. All right, so do some simplifying. Well, these cancel. It's the same on top and it's on bottom and it's a product, so those go away. Here I can subtract the exponents and then I can also factor out a negative one over 128. So when I subtract the x, uh, the sum comes from the fact that I'm doing a product, but I add my exponents. So that's where the sum comes from. And then after I factor out the negative one over 128, I get this expression, because I just have this one minus this one. Notice if you foil all this out, your x sub i's will go away, or x sub i squareds will go away. You've got a minus 160 here, and you've got a plus 152 here, so you get negative eight. And then I got a plus 1600 and a minus, uh, whatever that one is, uh, is that 1600? No, 6400. So this one must be a 5776. And so when you do that subtraction, your constants, you get 624, but you're adding it up n times. That's where the n comes from. So this was just some algebra to simplify that stuff. We need this ratio to be less than some positive constant k. Okay, well, in order to get that less than or equal to k, let's do some more algebra. E to both sides, 
multiply by negative 128, flips the inequality. Now we need to subtract this over and divide by negative 8. I do that, I would get the numerator, and then I'm trying to show that the best critical region has a mean. So let's also divide both sides by n, and I get the mean is less than or equal to some constant. This is an ugly expression, but it just has to be a constant, right? So we have mean less than or equal to constant. All right, so second part of the problem says that we want to find the C and we want to find the N if the alpha is supposed to be 0.05 and the beta is supposed to be 0.05. All right, so we want the probability that we reject when we shouldn't. That's what this is, right? This is probability of rejecting when we shouldn't. No hypothesis is true to be 0.05. And then remember, beta is the probability of a type 2 error. So this is probability that we don't reject, don't reject, when we should. Except that this should be less than C. Actually, that should be mu is equal to 76. I don't know why I have that written like that at all. This is definitely a typo. This should be mu equals 76. That's what we're doing in this particular problem. So we reject when we shouldn't. That's the first probability. We don't reject when we should. So this should be mu is equal to 76 here. All right. So first one, I want this equal to 0.05. So then the Z score for associated for C would need to be equal to negative 1.645. That will give us a probability of 0.05. So I subtract the 80 and then divide by 8 over the square root of n because I'm doing the z-score for a sample mean. That's where this comes from. The second one is over here. I need this z-score. Notice it's x bar greater than c. I need that to be equal to 1.645, because this is a right tail probability. This one's a left tail probability. That's why the signs are opposite here. Okay, well notice that if I multiply both sides of both equations by 8 over root n, I get c minus 80 is negative of c minus 76. Gives me c is equal to 78 pretty quickly. Okay. So, we already have set up our critical region. No matter what the n is, the c has to be 78, okay? And that automatically gives us a, a, probab or a, yeah, a probability that we make a type one error of 0.05 based on this particular hypothesis test. So now let's see if we can figure out the, what n has to be. So we just plug it, I just plug the 78 back into the first equation and rearrange to get n is, equal to 43.2964. The problem said approximate, so I'm gonna approximate by using 43. I know usually we would go up to 44 to make sure things are okay, but it literally just says just approximately equal to. So I'll approximate it with a 43. Okay, so what this would do in this particular case, if you're testing 80 versus 76, if you use a C, a critical region to be, uh, the sample mean is less than 78, and you take a sample size of 43, this is going to give you a significance level of 0.05 and a power of 0.95. Remember, power is the complement of the probability of making a type 2 error. So we have, we have a significance level of 0.05 and a power of 0.95. So... All right, uh, notice in that per first equation, I could have just written it as C is equal to 80 minus the 13.16 over the square root of N. If I just would have solved it for C. In particular, what I want you to notice, there's not a 76 in there. Okay, here's what I mean. If there's not a 76 in here, this C doesn't depend at all on what the mu was. Okay. So if I have a fixed alpha and a fixed n, if I pick my significance level and I pick the sample size, then the critical region that I use for how the, it will have the exact same C, that's gonna give me the best possible test in terms of power that I could possibly get 
uh, when mu is uh, for well, no matter what the mu is in the uh, H1. Okay, no matter what the mu is for the alternative hypothesis. So this gives us the definition of what we mean by a uniformly most powerful test. So if the test defined by the critical region of, of a size alpha, it's a uniformly most powerful test if, no matter what the alternative is for H1, it's the most powerful test that you can come up with. So we refer to them to C as the uniformly most powerful critical region of psi of alpha. So in the previous example, then the X bar being less than or equal to C is a uniformly most powerful test because, again, given alpha and given a sample size, the C doesn't depend at all on what the mean for the, uh, the alternative hypothesis is. Now notice that it says it's the most powerful test, but doesn't tell you what the power is, right? If you also want a particular power level, then you have to start messing with the C, or excuse me, start messing with the N, start messing with the sample size, okay? But if all you're interested in is a particular significance level, and you don't worry about what the actual power number is, then a critical region of this form is is the most powerful critical region for a particular c the c doesn't change at all no matter what this mean is the c won't change the only time the c changes is if you're adjusting the sample size to make the test to, to make a power level that you are comfortable with when don't get confused by most powerful test the power may be really really small but it might be the most powerful test that you can come up with based on the alpha and the sample size that you're willing to use, okay? So just because it says most powerful test does not mean the power is high. It just means it's as best as it can get, okay? If, again, in general, if you want higher power, if you want the power to get bigger, then the only way really to do it is to make the sample size get bigger as well. We're going to do more of these, but again, this is this literally is the last definition I'm doing this semester. This is it. <laughs> We're done. We'll do examples of how to find these things in class. Literally, that's all we're going to spend the rest of the rest of the week on is just doing examples, and then probably just giving you time to work on your uh, take-home final, which again I will give it to you on Wednesday. So I will talk to you tomorrow.